we to remember these men and women um, and the places. Let's get a history map mm. and let's incorporate um, our culture and our history and be proud. I guess my point is, and coming back as a, as a tourist, a Dublin born and bred, where are the 1916 sites? The GPO is an iconic building and even there when I did my tour, the tourists were lapping it up. They wanted to see the bullet holes, they wanted to see the munition factory, they want to see the field hospital, the cellars, where they burrowed out. I know that there's a plan in place for 2016 for a museum within and I really hold great hope that, that, that they will um, present the GPO for the iconic 1916 status that it deserves. Then I walked down to Jervis Street to retrace my grandmother's footsteps and um, I see a shopping centre, I see the Leprechaun Museum, um, I see no indication again of, of what went on here. Yeah, well the fact that it's a shopping centre, I mean, much as I like shopping and going and get my clothes, it does concern me because, I mean, that was the plan for Moore Street. If they, you know, they built a shopping centre here with no indication of the significance. And then they um, put a, a planning application in for a shopping, a monstrosity of a shopping centre on uh, the very, very historical important site of Moore Street where, you know, the leaders of the Rising um, uh, met and had a, a council of war and the last moments of, of the of the Easter Rising, uh, the most significant, a national monument, and they consider, you know, demolishing it and making it into a yeah. shopping centre. Worries me because you can see what they will actually do. Absolutely. They did that here, yeah. so there's no reason yeah. to imagine that it wouldn't be something that they would go ahead. So I think it's, it's, it's important, you know. I mean, you can buy clothes anywhere, can't you? You know what That's I mean? That's right. I think we have an, enough um, we shopping, have shopping centres. Uh, uh, my mum is 93 years old, and um, she always felt guilty that she didn't ask her parents more about their national activities. And because I'm an emigrant and I can't visit her daily or take her to her appointments or show her her grandchildren. I said, Mum, I'll help you find out their story. My mum um, is really totally surprised because there were no other members of the family that were um, had any nationalistic tendencies as far as we know. Mm -hmm. So when I was reading the, the witness statements, I came across an account of um, that placed her with my grandfather as sponsors for Anya Heron. So perhaps my grandmother came in through knowing my grandfather who was with John McBride in the Boer War in South Africa fighting with the Boers against the British. So that might have been a way. And she was also um, romantically linked with Con Colbert. So it could have been her association in a group. I know she went to Cayley's and according to the census she was a fluent Irish speaker as well. I think maybe the women were ahead of their time mm -hmm. um, and certainly getting women written into the proclamation and the fact that I know in the Irish Citizen Army they were, definitely were treated as equal because James Connolly uh, was very progressive in that way. And what were Tom and Lucy's roles inside the GPO? Well Tom had his original orders from Tom Clark weeks before the rising but they were changed at the last minute and uh, Porrick Pierce asked him to go to Kildare to mobilise the, um, the troops down there. Um, so Tom marched up um, overnight with the Maynooth 15 um, via Glasnevin and arrived on Tuesday uh, with a, a band of 15 men. And when Pierce met them, he said, um, you men have done so much for your country already, you need do nothing more, or at least that's uh, one of the accounts I've read. So when he went into the GPO, um, he was sent out again, I think, to City Hall and the Exchange Hotel and Liffey Street. So he was involved in a lot of um, uh, activity down there. Um, Lucy was um, a member of the medical um, nursing contingent. So though I do know she was um, delivering dispatches and she was moving between the Hibernian Bank and the GPO and she was out and about in the line of fire um, messaging. Um, when Tom arrived in the GPO she arrived with a basin of water and um, a pair of clean socks for him and he thanked her kindly so I thought that was a very lovely touch in amongst the fire and the munition factory and the bravery and courage to see that act of um, concern and kindness and then three years later they were married.
Well, I believe they were inside the GPO making yeah. their way down through the building. Okay. And when they got as far as, far as Moore Street, we know there was a barricade at the end of a British um, firing line at the end of Parnell Street. One of the girls momentarily forgot precautions and she was fired at. They changed their route then, and they actually, I believe, the Colosseum Theatre was here at the time. Okay. They went on top of the rooftop here. Um, on the left, is it? Uh, just on top of the Colosseum. Okay. To make their way over to what would be, I suppose, Abbey Street, Middle okay. Abbey Street. Yep. Yep. Okay. But if we take this um, arcade down, that will take us out to where they came out on the other side. Sure, sure. So, so there's Moore Street. Street here. Um, they hoisted a Red Cross flag, but there was no respect for that, and the bullets were still firing. So they made their way from window to window, okay. um, and through the courtyard. Which we see here. The bar and the Colosseum. I, I, yeah. really, I don't know the layout, but yeah. we come out on the other side now on what is Princess Street, I believe. Last time we were back on Henry Street and they were going through the Colosseum sure. and they had to wait a while, sure. um, maybe half an hour or so, and they actually picked up two men from the GPO, I think possibly the last two men, Dermot Lynch and Harry hmm. Boland, so they joined the party okay. and we've come out now and we're on Princess Street. The Metropole Hotel used to be there where Penny's was and the Freeman's Journal office, so they made their way down and we have the priest, I think Father Flanagan, um, a British medical doctor, George O'Mahony, originally from uh, Cork, um, Red Cross men, the wounded, the women, and these two um, volunteers that were, we believe, the last in the GPO. So they're making their way down to Jervis Street and we're going to cut into Williams Lane. And Williams Lane is also noted for where James Connolly, I believe, was shot. So there's right. a barricade down here okay. um, as they enter. So Let's go over. When, yeah. I, when I was at the Arbor Hill, I told um, Jim Conley Heron what I was doing. Mm. He's quite um, very supportive that this lane kind of makes, makes its way into the history books as okay. well. So when they reached here, they found themselves surrounded. Uh -huh. And when they reached here, there was a barricade, a burning barricade, three or four feet high, I think. They were in a predicament, I think, because they couldn't go forward and they couldn't go back. I think some of the men um, helped them through and they actually got through without a scratch but when they got to the end of the lane there was another barricade so they really had a predicament and at this stage I think the priest, priest according to the account that I'm familiar with he gave them conditional absolution so they are in the middle of the battlefield these women with the wounded mm. all of them believing that this is yes. this is it and I think this laneway is very significant in the battlefield as well because I believe it's where James Conley was shot. They soldiered on and mm -hmm. I think they came to another barricade here of petrol tins but when they came to the end there was fire coming from down where Jervis Street is, that was their destination but there was also fire coming um, from this end. Okay. So they crossed over the road and this is where the story gets a little confusing because I've talked to some other people in the know mm. and they say the women entered one of these houses and ended up in a courtyard at the back. Okay. Now we can't do that but we could cut through there. Yep. So we're on Abbey Street now, I believe Middle Abbey Street. I think the British mil military doctor um, and the priest left them at this stage to clear the way and to go down and negotiate um, their entry into Jervis Street. Um, 
Um, we're here on uh, North Lots now, which is at the back of um, Abbey Street, where sure. we believe they, the women and the wounded, went into a house while because the priest and uh, the British medical um, officer had had left to clear the way for them to Jervis Street and. The priest did come back, and it seemed like ages, I think, and they were waiting here at the back of a courtyard. Mm -hmm. um, he came back. Uh, they didn't see um, uh, Dr. O'Mahony again, but they mentioned how helpful he was to them, and that great, gave him great credit for his assistance. So the priest has come back with some soldiers um, to accompany them to, to Jervis Street. And when they arrived at Jervis Street, uh, they weren't welcome. Um, the hospital was full of refugees. They did, I believe, take in the badly wounded, mm. but but not um, the people with minor wounds. And then they were offered passes home, but they declined that because I think they knew the fate of the group of women that had earlier left the GPO and they had actually possibly got news that they were um, interrogated and held at Broadstone Station. Mm. So they declined that offer made their way um, into a storeroom in Jervis Street. Now they were very tired and weary and some of them say they hadn't slept in um, six days since the GPOs, at least right. I imagine slept properly. So yeah. you can be, imagine be exhausted the at that stage, um, yeah. So they, they gained access into a, a storage area in the hospital mm. and they all crowded in there very quietly because there was a lot of sniping going on down at Jervis Street. Mm. The British were there and there was definitely fire. And the account also mentions how one girl became hysterical. So that's bringing it into real life, real trauma. So they were um, allowed to spend the night, I think, um, in the, the waiting room or the dispensary. Um, they huddled together and a nurse actually opened the door and uh, such was the state of them um, that she actually thought they were dead. Um, she screamed, I believe. Yeah, she screamed um, in horror, yeah. yeah. Um, so the next morning, um, I think they they were allowed to, to make their way home and I, I think they all lived in the same direction. Um, but again, they were stopped. Mm. Um, and at that point, it looked like they were going to be searched, I think. And what was interesting here was one of the nurses held a copy of the proclamation in her bag. So that was the last thing um, she wanted to give away their identity. Um, this was on the Saturday, so the surrender had happened. Mm. Um, and then I believe that as they were making their way up towards Parnell Street area, they actually came across the men from the, the main garrison who had survived, who mm. were all lined up, and I believe they were t being taken to the rotunda. Okay. And what was really uh, poignant about that for me was that I thought that in amongst those men were their brothers and their uncles, fathers, sweethearts, but they couldn't, um, they couldn't let on, recognise each other because they were uh, flying under the guise maybe of uh, Red Cross nurses not coming them on mm. and they didn't want to give anything away and then I often wondered if uh, that was the last time they maybe saw some of those men so that was a very uh, moving moment for me reading the story and thinking of my grandmother. We're on Liffey Street now and um, one of the accounts I think places the women and the wounded here mm. um, but what was interesting to me was my grandfather was in the GPO, but he was sent out to City Hall and the Exchange Hotel. Mm. And also, I believe, at a house here on Liffey Street. And I wonder, did they cross paths here, my grandmother and my grandfather? So, behind, yeah, yeah. so behind we have Jervis Street Hospital, which is now a shopping centre. And I believe during the Rising, there were 450 treated and maybe 50 fatalities. Um, there was definitely a lot of action around here, but I don't see any um, indication of that. It's a key 1916 site. Um, I'd love to see a plaque or some indication that um, of what happened here to remember um, the men and women um, and children of 1916. I see the Leprechaun Museum and um, it seems to be quite a vibrant area. Mm. But I see no indication um, 
of, of what happened. I know about Moore Street, I'm involved um, in the Save Moore Street campaign, I feel passionately about it. As an emigrant returning, I guess there's an element of nostalgia, but it's a, a, a centuries old street market. Um, it's the last place where this, some of the signatories um, and leaders uh, spent their last days, the place of surrender. The laneways are hugely significant where the O'Rahilly was gone down. Um, I don't want to see those go. I don't want to see another shopping centre. Do you think Ireland could do a better job in terms of remembering its history? I definitely do. Um, I think there's an awful lot of history to remember and that needs to be remembered and particularly in the current climate when I've come back and I see the, dis the disparity between the have and the have nots and even while we've been filming um, I've averted my eyes to homeless people and when I go to Moore Street I see graffiti, vomit, um, I smell the stench. It, it, I can't believe it, it, it beggars belief because I think if people knew the history and made the connection, and it's not just the relatives, we all have a connection with our history, whether we were, whether it's our community, through our sporting clubs, um, everybody would have a 1916 connection. My mum had no idea of what her mother had been through. She knew little bits, but her mum and that whole generation, they they didn't talk about it. Mm. Some of their work was in secrecy, especially coming them on. That's probably why they were so effective was because um, they were carrying out um, their operations um, under the skies. What do you think when it's such a serious um, part of our history happened here and we don't have a recorded in any way whatsoever um, were the actual participants, the people that took part in fought for Irish freedom, that give us the, the republic that we live in now, the yeah. country that we live in now. And we've got this, you know, not much as nice tourist attraction here, the National uh, Leprechaun Museum, which is not much such thing as leprechauns, you know what I mean? But there are, these were real people. They were, uh, you know, they weren't, leprechauns. they weren't leprechauns, they were real people. But that the Irish would be happy enough to sort of, you know, um, have this leprechaun as our emblem of, of Irish nationality when we have real people that we should be honouring um, for the work, what they did. I, I just beggars believe sometimes, you know, when you just see this, doesn't it? Is it dumb and dying what it means to be Irish, do you think, or not? I or? think we've moved beyond that whole yeah. stage Irish leprechaun because I actually did the 1916 Rebellion walking tour with Lorcan mm. and he had a group of them all over the world. Now they were lapping it up. They were, their yeah. jaws were dropping. You wouldn't mind if it was there if it was there alongside something that was a serious thing, but Absolutely. to have it there instead yeah. of having um, something that yeah. marks this a significant location um, as part of the Easter Rising, I think it's a little bit... Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Donna. I yes. think that, that is the whole point. Um, we, want to, we want to know these people, we want them named and we want the places marked. My grandmother, um, she was still very much involved um, in activities after the rising and the war of independence and um, working for the um, prisoners development fund and raising um, support for for the families that were often left destitute when the men were in prison and um, unfortunately uh, executed so she certainly kept up her national activities um, she married my grandfather in 1919 and he was appointed commandant of the first battalion after ned daly mm. was executed then after the Free State, uh, my grandfather was appointed Captain of the Guard. Um, he was the first Captain of the Guard and he was there from 1922 to 1947. So unfortunately they had a tragedy because they were both known to authorities mm -hmm. and in 1920, during a British raid, their firstborn child, uh, Maureen, known, we know her as um, Mary Patricia, she um, lost her life and when I read my grandmother's pension file she said it, w it was as a result of a military raid. So I think um, my grandmother took some time off then, um, understandably so, she had been through a lot and my grandfather was actually imprisoned in um, Wormwood Scrubs and later Brixton. 
um, set about raising their family, which um, they had four more children. Okay. The research that you're doing, do you think it's tied a closer bond to your mother at all? Or? Absolutely. Instead of talking about who's died or the weather, we get right stuck into <laughs> questions about, um, I have many, many questions about her mother and, and who they were as people. What type of people would do that, would go against the norm, would, um, you know, I know at the time they were jeered and sneered at and it wasn't a popular thing to do. And also they very much knew that they had their lives on the line, particularly my grandfather, because he had fought in the Boer War against the British Empire. Now, had he been caught, I think it would have been more than imprisonment for him because he, because of his um, involvement um, in South Africa.